course, figure Sven Backman that talks about topological indices with interactions. All right, thanks, Anton. Uh, oh, yes, thanks, Anton. Uh, thanks to all of the organizers as well for inviting me. It's uh, certainly it's been a pleasure this week. I've learned a lot. And so I was actually, when I was invited, the, the title was kind of given to me. So I decided to, to keep it and to fill it with, uh, with content. Uh, so that's, uh, that's joint work, mostly with Alex Bowles, Wojciech de Roek, uh, Martin Fras, and, and Yoshiko Gata. I won't have much to say about actually C-star algebras, K-theories, and non-commutative geometries, but I'll say, I hope, a few interesting things about uh, correlated quantum matter, uh, condensed uh, matter systems. And it, it does have relation with, with the other things. So, um, so let's get started immediately. And instead of, of giving you an, an outline, I'll, I'll try to immediately formulate the question. So I think most people here know that if I give you a unitary U and a projection P on a Hilbert space, you and you know under assumptions, of course, you can form uh, what's called the friend or the Fredholm index of the operator PUP, seen as an operator on the range of P. And uh, it is, it is you know, in reasonable situations, it's given by a trace of P minus U, P, U star to some high enough odd power. And this is an integer, okay? So that expression, that trace is, a, is an integer. And it's something that has been now well understood for, well, 40 years now. Uh, it dates back, you know, in, in its mathematical formulation, or at least to Avron Seidel Simon, where they applied this to the quantum Hall effect, right? And, and there, so if you have non interacting particles, the, the, the meaning of these symbols is that P is the Fermi projection, and U is an operator that moves charges. So a typical example, you know, that, that these authors had in mind at the time was that you slowly uh, increase uh, a magnetic flux across a plane, okay? And so, you know, what I, what I want to point out here is that the, the, the operator in the trace, P minus U, P, U star, it's really a measure of how much P changes under the action of U, okay? And also a point which, uh, which is important, I think, is here in this non-interacting setting, P, is at the same time the state as, a, as the Fermi projection and also the operator of charge really, because you know, uh, the state is given by filling up uh, levels, right? So in this non-interacting setting, there's just one operator, P for both state and charge. And in fact, in, in, a, in, a, in the interacting setting, which I'm interested in, uh, we'll see that this is a bit different. Okay, so having this, you know, this is again very well understood for free fermions, non interacting fermions. And so the question I, I, I want to ask and, and partially answer today is can you find a similar index in an interacting setting, right? Where, where really P, for example, there's no Fermi projection anymore if you're in an interacting setting. So, so the, this whole expression here does not really make sense in, a, in an interacting setting. And we'll see that if you move to this interacting setting, so the answer will be positive. So we can construct an, an interacting index and we'll see that as a bonus, uh, we get not, not, not only integer values for this index, but rational values. And that these rational values are, are related to other things such as ground state degeneracies and anions. So, you know, in this, in this, during this week, we've heard this word anion many times but it, it's always a little bit mysterious uh, and, or if it's not mysterious, then it's usually, you know, not very clear from a mathematical point of view here. So here, you know, these anions will really come out of the theory and not for specific models for kind of explicitly solvable models, but really uh, out of, you know, generic, uh, generic um, models where you just need to have a conserved charge. We'll, we'll get to that. So um, let me start, uh, you know, talking about this interacting version of the index by concentrating on, you know, what is P minus U, P, U star? So P minus U, P, U star is the change of, of the ground state projection. Let's try to understand, say something about how you can compute the change of the ground state projection. 
So in these applications that I have in mind, which is always you know, quantum Hall effect really uh, for now. So you have a family of Hamiltonians parameterized typically by a magnetic flux. So it doesn't need to be, right? So I'll, I'll keep the discussion general, although you know, this is what I have in mind. And uh, uh, you know, associated to this, uh, to this Hamiltonian, you have a family of projections P of phi. So you, you want to have a smooth family of Hamiltonians and a smooth family of projections. So typically, this would be the P of phi. It doesn't need to be a one-dimensional projection. It'd be a finite dimensional projection, uh, which is associated to a spectral patch, which is gapped away from the rest of the spectrum. So that makes it smooth in, in the parameter phi. And so here's a little calculation that you can make. It was made by Kato, you know, 60 years ago. P as a family of projections, you know, P squared is P. If you take the derivative of that, you see that P is off diagonal with respect to, you know, P dot, sorry. So the derivative of P with respect to the parameter phi is off diagonal with respect to P in the sense that, you know, it doesn't have, you know, the P, P dot P and one minus P, P dot one minus P are zero. So you can express it uh, as just this combination. Okay, so that's just because it's a, it's a projection. That's true for any family of projections. And so, you know, you can now, it's really just stupid algebra. You massage this a little bit and you write it as a commutator. And so what you get is that P dot is expressed as a commutator of some operator here with P, okay? So when you see that, you're pretty happy because this looks like, you know, the typical equation you get for the Heisenberg evolution. Um, okay. And so that operator that comes here, written here, this IP dot P is really the generator of the flow P of, you know, that maps phi to P of phi. Okay. And that's what, that's what was uh, recognized by Cato a long time ago. But now, you know, we've heard also this week a lot that one thing which is very important in, 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 in this interacting setting uh, is that, you know, your, you know, things that generate dynamics, so Hamiltonians are sums of local terms, okay? And you see this kind of expression which involve a, a spectral projection and, and its derivative does not tend to have such nice lo locality properties. So here, when I say locality property, what I think is, you know, that the dynamics generated by I P dot P would not satisfy Lee Robinson bounds. Okay, because P dot P has no re, you know, this commutator has no reason to be a sum of local interactions. So, so what do you do with this? Well, that's, you know, you try to replace it, you see, because this equation here, you know, it's, I can, I can change this quite a bit and still have the, the same valid equation. And this is what was realized by, I think, originally by Hastings, and uh, and then with uh, with with the Hook and Fass, we, we found some some generalizations of this. And Monaco and Teufel did the same for fer fermions on the, uh, for lattice fermions, where our, our work was more for bosons. And so here's you know here's what you what you can construct. You can construct an operator i. So it's an operator. So you know. I, I will not reintroduce the, the, the algebra of observables of, of a lattice system. I think we've seen that many times. So I, you know, I built on what other uh, speakers did. So I think that we are in such a, a quantum lattice system. So A are elements in, an, in the observable algebra. So we can construct a, an operator on the observable algebra um, that has the following property. It's, it is the inverse of, taking the commutator with a Hamiltonian, okay? And this is, you know, this is what it means. So if you, if you, you start with, a, with, an op, with an element A, an operator A in your algebra, it is the same as you take the commutator of A with a Hamiltonian, and then you take I of that, right? So in that sense, taking the commutator with H and, and I are inverse operations. Of course, they're not inverse, you know, I is not an inverse of taking the commutator with a Hamiltonian everywhere, but only for those operators that, that are off diagonal with respect to P. So you see, I have this Hamiltonian, I have the spectral projection P associated to it. So that spectral projection, you know, you can decompose any observable according to that spectral projection. Some of these observables are off diagonal in that sense, okay? So for those observables, you can, I can construct this map I. There's an explicit expression uh, for it, 
Uh, I think Bruno flashed it yesterday during the discussion session, but it won't really play much of a role. So instead of writing in you know, big formulas, I think it's just useful to, to, to know this property. That's an inverse of the, uh, what's sometimes called the Liouvillian, taking the commutator with a hand. That, of course, all of this works well, provided, again, I am in the gapped situation. So P is isolated from the rest of the spectrum with a range of P, uh, the, the, the spectral values of P are isolated from the rest of the spectrum by a gap. So if we take this for granted and we construct the following object, I of H dot. So I have this family of Hamiltonians. I can, you know, I, I can compute the, uh, the derivative, okay? And I apply my map I to it. Let's see what, what it does. And that's a, cal that, that's a calculation that was done by Hastings Wen and, and that I did again with, with uh, uh, Bruno, uh, with Michelakis and Sims. No, oh, sorry. So you see, if I plug this I of H dot that I call G for simplicity in, in a commutator with P, I'll do this calculation. I'm the first speaker, so I hope people will still be awake enough. So this I of H dot commute, commute, commuted with P, right? So this I has the property that, you know, it, you know I, I wrote it up here. It, it, you know, you can move in functions of the Hamiltonian in and out of, it, of I. So this I can move it out of the, of, the, of the commutator because P is a good function of the Hamiltonian. If it's, if it's gapped, it's even a smooth function of the Hamiltonian, right? So I, so I move the, the I somehow out of the commutator. Then I see here, I have the commutator of the derivative of H with P. Of course, P is a spectral projection of H, so it commutes with H, right? So the commutator of, of you know, the, uh, sorry, the derivative of the commutator is zero, and so I can move the derivative from H to P up to a sign, okay? So I move it here, change the sign. And what do I see? Well, here, uh, and now it's on the same slide, so you can still see, you know, that it's I, commutator of the Hamiltonian with P dot. P dot is, a, is an off diagonal operator, as we've seen, right? So I can, I can look at the, you know, the equation I had up there, and I and commutator with H are inverse of each other, so, so I obtain P dot. Okay, so you see that the, the, the equation I get at the end is P dot is minus IGP, right? So this operator G is generating the flow of phi to P of phi, okay? So simple calculations once you've, you know, once you've, you've derived this equation. Like this. Now you see, um, Indeed, so one thing I, I should emphasize now is that this map I is local in the following sense. That's, that's the notion of locality we've seen a lot this week. If B is a, is a local observable, in fact, more generally, if it's an almost local observable, so you know, it's local up to tails that decay fast in, in, in the distance to some, some fixed set, then I of B uh, is again an almost local observable. So really you have to think that I does not change the support of observables. It does, but up to, up to tails that, that are irrelevant, okay? So in particular, if H is a, you know, if H is a sum of local terms, then H dot is a sum of local terms because it's given by the derivative of each term uh, separately. So I of H dot is a sum of local terms. So unlike uh, the very first one I gave you, I of H dot is a nice Hamiltonian and it's a nice Hamiltonian that generates the flow. So what I've, what I've constructed here is a local, you know, a locally generated flow of ground state projections, okay? Now, you see, now that I have this explicit expression, I of H dot, you know, I see that if the Hamiltonian, you know, in, for some reason changes only in some fixed region of space, which I call lambda here, then, so, so that means H dot is supported only in a fixed region of space, then I of H dot is again supported only in, in that fixed region of space. It's also local in that sense, okay? The, so the, this generator of the flow of P is really supported only where the Hamiltonian changes, which you know, if you think about it, makes sense. Okay, so that's one thing. So this, you know, this map I can use it to generate a flow of, of, of ground state projections, which, which in our context, again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm after a way of describing uh, you know, changes in, project, in, in ground state projection. So I, I, you know, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Now, interestingly, and this will play a role, there's something else I can do. 
if I take for any operator Q, so you know it's it's very similar, but not exactly the same what I want to do now. So if I take any operator Q, I, I say Q because it's going to be the charge afterwards, but but at this point it doesn't play much of a role. It's any any element in my observable algebra. And I form that thing again. Okay, and I give that a name, I call that K. Okay. Let's again do a little calculation. It's the, it's the last little calculation I want to do. So if I, if I commute that with P, so you see, I, I just, again, plug it in here. It's a very similar calculation than before. You know, again, because P is a function of the Hamiltonian, I can move the I out. And then I have inside, uh, you know, a double commutator to which I can apply Jacobi's identity. So I, I do the algebra. I reorganize things a little bit. So you see in the Jacobi identity, I get uh, once a QP in, the in a small commutator commuted with H, and then I get HP commuted with Q. So HP, so this term of course vanishes, P is the spectral projection of H. What about the first one? I've changed sign so that it looks good. You see it's I of commutator of H with something, right? And what do we know? We know that I and commutator of H are inverse operations of, of each other. So this, so the second term here in, in, in purple, no, in salmon, I don't know what the color is, uh, that is zero. While the first one, well, it reduces to just the commutator of Q and P. It's, it's again, the same property of, of this map I, right? And so you see, I have here, what do I have? I have that K commuted, commuted with P is the same as Q commuted with P. So K minus, uh, so K minus Q or Q minus K leave the range of P invariant. Right, so, and, and this is really an important thing that will now play an important role. So for any operator Q, right, I can construct a new thing, K, such that Q minus K leaves the range of P invariant. If you prefer to think of P as being a one dimensional projection, what, what is this saying is that if I have an operate, any operator Q, I can, I can modify it by adding this K so that, uh, you know, the, 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 the vector in the range of P, the unique vector in the one dimensional range of P would be an eigenstate, uh, an eigenstate for Q minus K, okay? So by, by modifying Q a little bit, I can make omega, the, or the state in P, you know, an eigenstate for, for Q, okay? Good. So what can I do with this? So you see, you know, I'm still don't, as Bruno was saying yesterday, we shouldn't forget where we started. My goal is to try to, 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 you know, to, to construct uh, an index which is related to you know, charge transport. So if you, have to, if you want to have charge transport, you have to have, a, you know, you have to want a, a good notion of charge, which is always related to uh, U1 symmetry. So I'm supposing now that my Hamiltonian is a bit more than what I had so far. It was a very general thing. It just needed to have a gap in the spectrum. Now I assume that, that it is U1 symmetric. So for this, what do I need? I need to have at each, so I'm, I'm in a lattice. So I'm thinking that at, at each site, I have a charge operator. You know, if, if you like free fermions uh, on a lattice, QX would be just a number operator at each site, okay? It ha so really what is important, whether fermions or not, it's that the, the spectrum of, of that operator is, is integers. So that when I take the exponential of that, I get a U1 representation, right? Because e to the two pi i times an integer is one, okay? So I have at each side a U1 representation. And I'm, and I'm assuming that H is symmetric, you know, is, is conserving that charge. So, you know, there's different ways to write it. The one I give here is not the most physical one, but the mathematically the one I will use, right? I will give that as a definition. So my definition of, of charge conservation for H or, or, or U1 symmetry is that if you take Q in a finite set Z, right, you pick a, a you know, finite set Z, and you look at the commutator of H with Q, you see that would be the change of charge. And if you, if you believe in, in charge conservation, then you believe in, in, the, in, the, in the conservation law, then where does the flow, where, where, where does the charge chain? Where across the boundary of the set. So that's exactly what, what I will get, that the, the commutator of H with this, the charge in a, in a set Z is supported at the boundary of that set that I denote by DZ. And here again, so I, I you know, have to take a strip. It's not a strict at the boundary, but a strip around the boundary, the final strip, okay? Okay, 
So if I, if I assume that, so I have a U1 charge, um, which is conserved by the Hamiltonian, and I, for each set Z, I can construct what I, what I did before, but now this is really the charge now. Okay, and I, and I look at I of that. So the first observation is that I, I call that KDZ. Why do I call that KDZ? Because, well, the commutator here is localized. You know, it's kind of a current across the boundary. So it, is, it was supported on the boundary of the, of the set Z. And then I of this, I being a local uh, operation, I of that is again supported on the boundary of DZ, you know, the boundary of Z, okay? And I know, you know, again, there's various ways of writing this, but I know that if I, if I add this Q or I subtract K to Q, I get something which leaves the ground state space invariant. Here's a way to write it. So, you know, this, uh, sorry, that's right. So this, this, uh, this operator S is E to the I lambda Q, right? So that's, if you, this SZ of lambda here, just to be clear, is, is this thing, right? So I look at the action of, of, of Q on the ground state. So you see, maybe I should also clarify ideas. If you have, if you have let's say, if you had a unique ground state of the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is U1 symmetric, so the ground state would be U1 symmetric, right? So here, what I do is, you know, I, I don't act with the full charge, but only the charge in a set Z. So of course, if, then you, you know, the state is not invariant anymore, okay? So, you know, this thing here is not, is not equal to P, but let's see what I can do. You see, P, P here is in the middle, right? So because P commutes with Q minus K, that's, that's what I derived in, on the previous slide. You can, of course, for free insert, you know, this conjugation by E to the I lambda Q minus K, okay? Okay, and that's, you know, that's a completely boring operation. Uh, but what, what, okay, let's, let's now give, it, give a name to this thing, to I lambda Q, e to the minus I lambda Q minus Z. I call that V DZ, right? And you see, I've gained one thing by doing this boring operation. SZ here, right? Or, or if, you, if you prefer, which is that. This is an operator that is supported on all of the set Z, okay? While V, and I call it DZY, because you see, I've multiplied by this operator here, which, okay, so, you know, on the boundary of, of, of the set Z, well, it's something different. I've really added this, this K, but away, so in the, in the bulk of Z, if you think of Z as being a, a, big, a, big, uh, a big region in the bulk, then, then in fact, this KZ is not there. So there's really just Q and it cancels out with this. So inside the bulk of Z, this operator here is acts as the identity, right? While, so it's really supported only on the boundary of DZ. And so this is what I've done. And I think I have a drawing here. So, you know, you can, you can look at this also kind of more analytically. You, you look how V is, is, uh, is generated and you see that it's generated by this KDZ, which is strictly supported on the boundary and, you know, with, with the conjugation by Q, which doesn't play any role. So really V, it acts only non-trivial of Z. And this is something we saw uh, in, in the talk of Lukash early in the, in, in the week. And I'll, I'll just you know, represent that in a specific case of a one-dimensional setting. So suppose that what you do here is, is you, you do a gauge transformation E to the I lambda Q on, on a half chain, okay? So, you know, you do, uh, you, 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 you try to rotate the ground state on a half chain, the ground state of a, a charge conserving Hamiltonian, right? And so you, you feel that in the bulk, so somehow if I wrote it only the half chain here, you feel that away from the boundary, out there, you know, you don't feel the effect of the boundary anymore. And so the action should be trivial, but, but, but the operator S, you know, it acts there, right? And so this is exactly what this V does now. It, it has exactly the same action on the ground state as S, but it's strictly, you know, because of the equation up there, it's really acting only on the boundary. Okay, so th this is a, a useful uh, application of this map I that I can, you know, on an invariant state, right? So when I, when I try to rotate only partly an invariant state, I can really make sense strictly uh, of this idea that really the action of the symmetries is, is, is localized at the boundary, okay? So that, now let's, let me come to, to, to the index. Um, so I, I'm, I'm doing this in a finite volume. 
Um, so, you know, the finite, and I put this on a torus. The reason is I don't want to have boundaries. If I had boundaries, I, I would leave, you know, lose the gap. So I put this on a torus. I want to compute the change of charge in a, let's say, in a half system. And of course, what I want to do is kind of measure the charge flowing across one of the edges. If I have charge conservation, of course, you know, whatever comes in here will go out there. But so I really, I, I, will, I will want to compute the change or the transport of charge across that line. So I have a charge operator. I have a Q bar is, you know, I denote Q bar Q minus K. I have a unitary that tra transports this charge. So think that it could be, uh, you know, slowly uh, changing a, a magnetic flux to drive a current. And the assumption is that this, you know, U commutes with the ground states. So that would be in, in that picture of, of a magnetic flux, that would be adding exactly one unit of quantum flux. Now, all the equalities I will say, by the way, are exact up to errors that decay fast in the size of the system. L is here, the, let's say the length of the torus. And I suppose that I have, again, it's charge conservation, not for the Hamiltonian, but for U really, so that the charge transport operator, now U star Q, U minus Q, that I call T is really has really two parts. One part, which is, you know, and this is strict as, as, as an operator, that is, there's an operator supported along that boundary plus an operator supported along the other boundary. And really what I'm interested in is only T minus or T plus, but only one of the two. So the charge transported across one of the edges. And so, you know, out of, the, out of this, so now I have three ingredients if you want to have Q, U and P, right? the charge, uh, the state, I mean finite volume, and the U which transports charge. Okay, so <clears throat> you see, maybe in fact I, I'm going a little slower than I thought, so maybe I'll I'll just go a bit fast on this. You can construct by by looking at this combination of three unitaries here. So U is the ch the charge transporting operator, and this is the kind of this modified gauge transformation. Uh, you can look at this Z and using it, you will, um, exactly. So using it, uh, you know, I, still, I will, I need to say a little bit about this. You know, this really has, has two parts. Again, you know, it has a part which is supported on the minus and it has a part which is supported on the, on the plus boundary. So looking only at what happens, concentrating on what happens on the minus boundary, uh, you will see that, that's exactly what will give you your index. Okay, so here's here's what here's here's uh, here's a theorem. The, in fact, the, the main theorem that I want to to uh, present here. So U is the charge concert, th that operator that transports charge, and V here. I just I change a bit my notation just so that it looks nice. It looks like something that people in this audience would recognize. So V is actually really this. You know, I have this Q and, and Q bar, which is the Q bar. It's the modified charge, and I look only at what happens at the boundary. So I, you know, it's a sum of local terms. So I can restrict my attention to a region close to that minus boundary, and I look at that at parameter value two pi. I make this combination of four operators: u star v star u v. I look at that at their action on the ground state p. And I see that these four operators, so P here does not need to be one dimensional. In fact, you see, I assume it that it's Q dimensional. So, you know, the first statement is that this combination of four operators leave the ground state space invariant. It's really an, uh, an operator that lives on the ground state space. And in fact, it is almost trivial, but not completely. It's equal, it's a multiple, it's a multiple of the identity on the ground state space. And in fact, a multiple given by a fraction. Right, so you see in this fraction, n is an arbitrary integer, but q is the dimension of the ground state space. So let's, let's uh, quickly comment on the, the assumption. So I have this assumption that I have a ground state space which is finitely degenerate. Unif so you see it's uniformly in the size of my, of my torus, at least for large enough sizes, okay. And I have this uh, topological order condition uh, which you know, I, I like to think of as a, as a local disorder condition, right, rather, which I, I write here, if, if you have a fixed uh, local observable A and you sandwich it between P, so P has many ground states, but what, what this condition tells you is that the, these ground states are, are all the same locally. They locally look all exactly the same because 
because really what you have that is that any local strictly local observable is just a multiple of the identity on the ground state space. Right? So, so it's this local topological order condition. And so I have here, you know, finally, after half an hour talking, I have this uh, an interacting uh, topological index, or rather a topological in index in an interacting setting. And I've, I've learned something, you know, in fact, I've learned two things, you know, it looks a bit different. It looks like this combination of unitaries, which the algebraically minded people here will, 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 will call, uh, you know, the, 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 the rational rotation algebra. It's the, the trivial rotation algebra, but it's still ra rational rotation algebra. So you have these operators U and V acting on the ground state space in a non-trivial fashion. There's a non-trivial commutation relation here between U and V. And you have really the value of the index that it's a fraction. Uh, it, it's a fraction where I know that the denominator is, has a certain value, namely Q, which is the ground state uh, degeneracy. Okay, so, so you know, <clears throat> um, Again, I think I think I'm, I I, I want to go very quickly about this. This is a little bit about about the proof, but really, in the case where you can take the thermodynamic limit, what you really can you know you can you can actually say what is exactly how do you compute the value of this, okay? And that is really that expression here. And what do you recognize? Well, what is it? U star Q U minus Q. That's the charge transport, right? The minus here, this index minus means again the charge transport across. The, the one of the two boundaries that I'm, that I'm interested on my torus. And so in the infinite volume limit, the value of my index is really just uh, the, uh, this expectation value of the charge transport. And it is this fractional value. Now you see, here's an important fact. Uh, you know, the state, because of my, of my um, topological order assumption, the state will have an infinite volume limit, right? But it may be that this, uh, this operator here, you see, it's an extensive operator. It, it lives along the line. So, so if, it's, if it's truly living along the line, this is not a local operator. You know, it doesn't live in the local algebra. And so it may be that its expectation value diverges as L goes to infinity. It depends on your choice of U. So in the case of quantum hall, this is not the case. You get a finite number. You can take the thermodynamic limit. And it's and you know and you can work in the infinite volume limit. You can phrase that a little bit more in a C-star algebraic fashion. There's other examples uh, uh, such as when U is the shift. So if you think of U as being the shift, then you really have an action across the whole line, and then you know this charge transport just diverges in the volume. So you see here, this is this is something which is in a sense interesting because you you have an index which is well defined in finite volume but may not be well defined in the infinite volume limit. Or you, or you may need to divide by L, you know, there's more to do. You know, it's a good index, it's additive, it's stable under transformations, uh, deformations of the unitary and of the state. Maybe I'll, I'll go fast. And here's, so how many, I have another 10 minutes, I suppose, okay. So you see, I want to make, you know, an, an interesting fact is that out of this, you can say something about anions. And so I, I would like to say this, you can construct, in fact, what we've done is we've explicitly constructed anions, although we didn't, I didn't quite say it so far. So I want to try to explain how that goes. You see, I have this operator that I call V, which is the exponential of, of Q bar. So Q bar is this modified charge, which leaves the ground state space invariant. It factorizes a two pi in two parts, one living on minus, one living on plus. Why? Because in the middle, you see somehow here in the bulk of, of gamma, uh, you know, the modification of Q to Q bar, so K is not there really, right? K is a modification of the boundary. And so E to the two pi IQ is an integer. You know, so Q, you know, E to the two pi IQ is one. So that's why you have a, this factorization at parameter value two pi. And so you can, you can convince yourself by clustering that in fact, not only does the full E to the two pi IQ bar leave the ground state space invariant, but each of its two factors, the one living here and the one living there, it's because they live far apart. And so they both act independently of the ground state and therefore both of them leave the ground state space invariant. So I have two operators and now you see, now suddenly what do I see? I see that Q bar minus and E to the two pi IQ bar plus are operators living on these, on these, along these loops. So I can think of them as operator living on loops. 
And there's two different types of loops on the, on the torus. We know that, right? There's those that are boundaries of, of something and those that are not, right? The trivial loops and the non-trivial loops. So if I have a trivial loop like this one, the action on the ground state is, is elementary, right? V alpha, so if you know, alpha is this, this loop bounding Z, then I can, you know, I, you know, it's expressed as e to, you know, this V is e to the pi I Q bar Z. This is, leaves the ground state space invariant. So this is really just a, a number and V alpha acts completely trivial on the ground state space. However, if I have a loop like this one, the gamma, the one that I ha have been interested in, in fact, that is not a boundary, right? It's, it, it's only part of the boundary if you want, but these non-trivial loops on the torus are not boundary of anything. So I cannot make this calculation here, right? E to the, it's not, you know, V gamma is not e to the pi, two pi i q bar of something. It's only part of it, okay? And so although the V associated to that loop here leaves the ground state space invariant, it's not trivial on the ground state space. So in fact, and this is exactly what happens, V gamma is an operator, this loop operators is exactly one of these operators that will cycle through the possible ground states. The, you know, if, if, if the range of P is non-trivial, there's more than one state, it will cycle across the, the various ground states uh, by just action of these, of these non-trivial loop operators. Okay, and now when you see hear this and you've, you've heard a little bit what people say about, about anions, you see that this has the right flavor. In fact, you can rephrase our the, the, the theorem as, 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 as being a theorem about, about commutation of loops. In the case of the, of the quantum Hall effect, at least, you have really what you have in the game are two loops that I call here SL and S minus. And what you're computing here is their commutator. It's something that lives locally around you know, their, their, their intersection. And so you can compute that locally and it's, and it's an integer. And so what then you can do instead of being in this finite volume setting, you can think, well, but you know, can I, can I, can I kind of open up these loops? Of course you can, right? Of course you can open up these loops. You see, again, let me just uh, try to, so here's these, you know, these loops are of this form. This is a sum of local terms. So I can cut out the sum as I want, and then I can define these loop operators also on open strings, if you wish. And so let's look, at, let's look at the following situation. So now I'm really showing that these loop really create anions upon the ground state space. So I take one of these loop V gamma now for an open path. Here's the open path gamma, okay? And I act with that on the vacuum state, on the, in fact, on any of the ground states, omega. Okay, now I'm really thinking of having more than one ground state. Call that state phi. So that actually is a state of a pair of excitations. Why? You see, because that, that string here cannot play a role. Because if I deform the string, the, the difference between the two would be associated to a closed string and closed strings or you know, loops have a trivial action on the ground state space. So really this, this phi describes an excitation here and excitation on the other side. And now you can ask two questions about this. First, can you compute the charge of that excitation? The answer is yes, because, you know, so what is the charge or the excess charge? If you want to, you see, you, you measure the charge in a large box around that excitation in the state phi and you compare it to the charge in this state omega, right? So that measures the charge of that, that, that localized excitations you've created. You know, it looks exactly as we did and you, you see that you get exactly N over, oh, it should be Q, I think. That used to be Q, they, 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 it's, that, it's, it's the fraction you get that I got in my index theorem. So these excitations, these localized excitations have fractional electric charge, okay? And the other thing that you can do is you, you can take two such uh, charges, one here and one there, and then you can move this one around the other one. That's what people usually call braiding. That's very, you know, again, here it's very explicit. It's concrete, there's no, you know, it's, it's in a sense very elementary, right? You just have these concrete operators that I've constructed explicitly. So what is, you know, you take phi, which is having this state here and you move alpha around it by V alpha. That's, you know, that's acting with this loop operator along this. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, I'll have time to go through this. So you see phi is V gamma omega. So here's V gamma omega. I can of course insert a V alpha here. Alpha is associated to a closed loop. So it acts trivially on the ground state. 
or maybe you may pick a phase, but it will cancel out. So that here is just my phi. You know, I cancel out the, the phase that I that I gain by acting again with a trivial V alpha, and then I <laughs> I do only very 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 trivial things, right? And then I multiply by one. And the only non-trivial thing I do is put the brackets in the right place. And I see what do I see in that in that bracket? Well, I see again these this combination, this commutator of V's, which is you know supported again on this little blob here. So it is a number to e to the power n over q. And I left, I'm left with just v gamma acting on omega, which, which was my original state here. So I've seen with that, that I have a non-trivial braiding of these quasi-particles, right? And so to, to, use, uh, to use words that were used before, these excitations created by open strings, they are localized, but not local, right? Uh, you, can, when you, you get a non-trivial phase when you braid one around the other. Now, of course, one question that would probably be asked here is, can you, you know, all of this was in finite volume with errors that vanish in the, in the, large, you know, in the size of the system. Can you make this you know, properly also directly in the infinite volume limit? So in the case of integer conduct, so the integer quantum Hall effect. So if you have a unique ground state, this has been done. This is work of, uh, of Kapustin and, and Supenko. And so that's in, you know, they have a slightly, here's their, uh, their setting, so it's really an infinite plane, and you you kind of pierce a flux across the plane, right? And what you do is you measure, you measure, you know, then then you will have a flow of charge radially away from that point. You, you look at the a, you know finite volume charge, you take the limit of Argo to infinity, but the whole setting is infinite volume. It's one way we can do this. Another way is to pick a, a along an infinite cylinder but it's still a finite you know finite radius and similarly take the, the limit of a, of a large radius that would also give you that an infinite volume at the end of the day okay that's uh, don't work with uh, Yushikoga. now one thing which i think really has not been done uh, is to phrase everything here uh, for topologically ordered systems right where you have more than one ground state i mean clearly it's a bit more it's a bit more tricky because you know these p ground states when you take the infinite volume limits that's what, uh, what Peter told us at the beginning of the week. Then you have super selection sectors. So they, you know, they, they don't talk easily to each other. So these unitaries that map one ground state into the, the other ground state, they're, they're, of course, they're not there anymore. They, there's no unitaries. So the whole setting will become a little bit more, more difficult. It doesn't mean that it cannot be done. It hasn't been done yet. OK. Um, OK, you know, in, in the setting of the quantum Hall effect, there's many things you can, you can say, you know, I've constructed an, an, an index. I've argued that it's related to charge transport. I mean, you can show these things now very concretely that the index is really the whole conductance. Uh, you may recognize this expression here. You know, this is really just algebra, so I will, I will not go through it. But that's the, that's the index, and it's equal to this, which is known by, you know, in the physics community as being the, 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 the whole conductance. For the more mathematically oriented people, you can also look at this and think, oh yeah, this is, this is adiabatic curvature. And I know that if I integrate that adiabatic curvature, I get the churn number, which is an integer. So of course it's the same. And you know, why is my index equal to the churn number up to the right numbers of two pi? Because in fact, you can show that this expression here as a function of phi, the, the fluxes, uh, that this is constant. So you can just as well integrate it. So the index is also equal to the churn number in that quantum hall setting. And there's a nice uh, relationship, which I unfortunately have no time to discuss. If you have a magnetic system and you have magnetic translation invariance, you get a relationship between the density uh, of, of charge, you know, the charge density, which I denote rho here, the, the, the flux per, magnet, uh, per unit cell and the conductance. It's a, it's a relation that sometimes uh, goes uh, by the names uh, of Aron, Dana, and Zach. But here again, it's in a fractional setting. Okay, so I've reached uh, the, the, end, uh, the end of my talk. Uh, again, I, I've gone through long ways to, but really at the end of the day, all I did was find a, a generalization of the Fredholm index uh, that we all know and, and, and love. That applies in particular in the quantum Hall effect from a non-interacting to an interacting setting. It has a little bit of a different, uh, you know, different flavor, but it's a bulk index. 
I would like to, in, to insist that unlike many things that we've seen, uh, which were this week, which were related to symmetry protected topological phases and therefore invertible phases, this is not an invertible phase because you know, as, as soon as I have more than one ground state, I'm in the, in the case of the fractional quantum Hall effect, which is, which is not, you know, it's really, you know, it, it's really not an invertible. It's one that in fact, as, you, as we saw, has anions as uh, localized excitations. Okay, so, so the construction of the index kind of gave us free these, uh, the existence of these quasi, uh, you know, these anionic quasi particles. And again, I think it's important to, to underline here, what were the ingredients? There's nothing, there's a, there's a charge conserving Hamiltonian, that's all, right, to construct these anions. So it's not, it's not in a specific, exactly solvable model that these anions came up, it's really in a general setting. And now, I mean, I think in this audience, many people would have liked to have something which is a bit more algebraic, so, and would live in, immediately in the infinite volume limit. It's not what I did. Uh, and I think there's still things to be done there to really formalize that uh, in the infinite volume limit. You, you have an expression, we can phrase everything completely in terms of automorphisms and derivations in the case of a unique ground state. But when you actually look, when does it apply, it really applies only in very specific cases uh, where, where essentially things are one dimensional, just like in fact the quantum Hall effect. All right, I think I've taken a few minutes uh, more. I hope it's okay and I'd like to conclude now. Thanks, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Is there any? Uh, yeah. No questions. So Ralph? Yes. I, I don't hear Ralph. Uh, Ralph? Uh, there? Okay. Well, maybe Bruno then first. Bruno, yeah, then Bruno. Okay, well, I have a, a question about sort of the last re remark you made, uh, Sven. Mm -hmm. um, that um, you can you can go in the unique ground state setting. Um, you can go to the thermodynamic limit and uh, uh, just like a uh, in in Anton's uh, work, right. um, but I don't really see what would be different if the ground state uh, on the torus is non-unique, and when the terminal right. limit, uh, uh, it may well be unique in, on the plane. But the operators you construct have exactly all the same properties. Um, I don't see why there is. What is the difficulty to treat that case? I, I, I don't. I mean, it, it, look, it, it, it depends a little bit, you know, what you mean by taking the thermodynamic limit. So clearly, you know, everything I did, and I actually even stated this, you, you, you can take the limits of this expectation value, right? right. As long as the, this, this commutator of four um, of these two unitaries is a local thing, this is really the key, then you can take the limit of this. You have a limit of the state, so you, you have topological orders, you, so this expectation value has a good thermodynamic limit and you will get N over Q. As, as so, you know. so for instance, I, I take a patch in the infinite plane and I try to flux through it and- Absolutely. And this whole so construction goes through, so it should, it should give you the fractional charge. Yes, but-, uh, but, but So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, you, you, you don't phrase the whole thing in, immediately in the thermodynamic limit. Right, for example, because both U and V are, are unitaries that do not exist in the thermodynamic limit. They're associated to these infinitely long strings. So, so there's no, the, you know, if you really set yourself immediately in the yes, thermodynamic limit- Yes, but you, limit, use, you use automorphisms, really. Well, so but I, you see the, the problem, so yes, you would like to do that, right? You, but you cannot be too naive because if you really try to just say, well, I replace this, commutator of unitaries by a commutator of, of automorphisms, so to say, then you lose the phase, in fact. You know, it's always a bit of a tricky thing because automorphisms precisely don't see the phase. So at some point you have to have a unitary. And so at least, you know, in, in what, uh, what we've done so far, you, you know, it does rely on the fact that, you know, Again, really that, the, that everything happens in a localized corner. So you, but, but we, we didn't quite, you know, I'm not saying that it's impossible, 
but we didn't quite find a way mm -hmm. to express, you know, it's, it's really about the proof. It's not about the results, right? I mean, don't misunderstand me. I believe that the result, you know, does work in infinite volume, but it's really about the, the arguments that we didn't quite get to a setting where really all you have are automorphisms and their derivations. And that would work immediately in a two-dimensional setting. Okay. And you know, the reason the reason is again, if you think of of the case of not quantum hall effect, but the case where u is is the shift, then this index is not defined in the in the thermodynamic sure. units. Yeah, so so of course you have to set it up so that you know that they will be finite. <laughs> right. finite exactly, number. exactly. Like like if you have a, a finite patch, uh, if the fact that it happens. In, in the middle of the infinite plane the, right. is not should not be a problem. Um, Indeed, because and, and the transport across that boundary would would converge and would be finite, right? So, yes, okay. yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, but we, we're still waiting to see it. Let's say. Oh, oh absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I make my remark, like Bruno. I think uh, essentially what you're saying was done in my paper with Sopenko to a large extent. So, but the, but in the in the in the non-degenerate case. No, 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 no. Much uh, uh, there's a whole section which applies both. Uh, oh, that's okay. Invertibility. Well, that so, makes that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> if, in fact, that is a starting point. We looked at the work of uh, Sven and the company. And just wanted to rephrase it in infinite one. That's the first thing we did. Uh, and just just the last section of the paper is about the invertible case. Like so, so for example, we show that, uh, say, fractional statistics of these fluxons is determined by whole conductance. So uh, that's in the penultimate section yeah. of the paper. Okay. Well, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. So you, you did exactly right. what you, what you said should be done. Yeah. We use this as this automorphism. And... Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Ralph, you have a question. Ralph, I wrote my question in the chat, but can oh. you hear me now? Now, yeah. now, now I can hear you, yes. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, my question was this index n by q always appeared in an exponential e to the 2 pi i n by q. So only the fractional part is really defined by your theory, not the integer part of this index. Um. Well, if, if you you could say so. In, well, but, uh, no, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure what you mean here. I mean, really, um, what you know? If you know e to the two pi i of something, then you only know something up to integers. Well, or you could say that precisely. I mean, the the integer is the index. It's not that it's you know. You're absolutely right. I mean, if I just compute you this this this, uh, this commutator of these unitaries, I don't know which integer I have. That's correct, of course. But it's you know, it's it's this winding number. It's really just the, 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 it's a winding number up to q if you want. So it, that's true. If you measure, if you if you compute you star, I mean, the, the commutator, you will define you determine only the the, the fraction. But you'd also say that the, this denominator is already determined precisely by the grounds of degeneracy. I mean, you know, we're not determining here the value of the, the index. We're just saying the index, the possible values of the index are uh, n of the q. Yeah. But uh, if you don't know what the index is, how can you say what its possible values are? So you shouldn't first define the index and then say its possible values are something. Do you I have mean, some other definition of this index independent of that? Well, you see, what, what of course, you you could also say well the value of the index is that trace right so you can you can compute that trace and that trace will you know if if you could compute it it would give you a, a, a fraction you know, the, the trace of u star q u minus q the, really the trace you know the expectation value of the charge transport and that that is not in the exponential that is, you you can okay. if you could so compute another... it that's n over q there's another formula which gives you n by q yes, absolutely. out of this theory. Yes, yes. You just didn't show us this formula, or maybe well, I, I, I guess I, you know, I, I went a bit quickly through it, but it's somewhere. Uh, where was it? Uh -huh. There, it, you know, there it is. Ah, no, where is it? Sorry, I'm, I'm getting lost in my own. So, you know, the, the index really is ah. this, right? Is this expectation okay. value? Okay. And you know, it is uh, in this particular 
fractional group because of some other computations which you did in greater detail. Exactly, I didn't give the details of that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That looks much better now. Okay, good. Uh, email. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the. So you, I think you highlighted uh, many points which appear yesterday in our discussion. Right. right. And if you remember, one more point from yesterday was what happens under uh, tensor products. So suppose you have uh, your theory, you take another theory with another Q, and you layer them. So therefore, you have the tensor product of it. Mm -hmm. uh, what it's happens? A, it's a very good question. I, we, we actually didn't think about this at all. So uh, I, I would hope uh, that, you know, that if, if you have a group structure uh, under tensoring, you would have under tensoring, additivity, yeah. additivity of the index. Uh, and I don't really know. Uh, yeah, we, we just didn't look at it. But, but it, it should be um, something that it's now, because the formalism is uh, so explicit, we should be able to answer. So oh, then absolutely. Uh, yes. it will be very absolutely. interesting. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. So it's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there maybe time for a quick question? Sure. Um, I'm just wondering how much of what you did relied on the fact that you were just looking at ground state projections or in particular the projection onto the lowest sort of energy region of this sort of gap system. So say I have an operator which has a just a chunk of the spectrum which is uniformly bounded away from every, from the other part of the spectrum it seems like and maybe that okay and there's an analogous um ltqo assumption there it, it seems like you can play a lot of this game there as well yeah I yes. mean, okay what it yes, means I don't know. no no absolutely exactly i mean from a from a pure mathematical point of view you just need an isolated spectral patch right uh you know which is uniformly degenerate in the volume uh, uh, you know, th that kind of gap uh, will give you uh, exponential clustering. Uh, and so if you have some sort of, you know, I but I don't know what it means, this topological order assumption for, for kind of not, not ground state projections, you know, they're, they're just never used. It doesn't mean that, you know, that you never have it. But, um, but if you had that kind of things, then, then sure, you can, you can play the same game. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. Uh, maybe one more. If you, Sven, if you calculate um, the index using this uh, the adiabatic adiabatic mm -hmm. formula, yes, the, the fluxes, um, you will get an integer, isn't it? No, no. I mean, if, no. if you if you really, I mean. <laughs> You know, again, I mean, this is a little bit, I, I'll, I'll confess, this is a bit of a weak point. There's no really explicit model where you can compute this and you get a fraction. You would think that if you, if you take, uh, you know, just the, the Landau Hamiltonian in strong magnetic field, if you computed it, you would get a fraction. Uh, but, uh, but uh, I, you know, I, I, there's no, and that's I confess again is a, is a weakness. There's no model where you can actually compute this in the in the fractional quantum hall case, of course. But um, so uh, if you go if you go back to the to the slide where we have this uh, index with the two fluxes, that is the Avron. Uh, 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 was it this one? Yes. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, you are saying that there is no way to, to calculate. Uh, we, have, we have sort of calculated something like that for finite systems, uh, just uh, twist, twist uh, yes. the, the shift operators and then uh, just mm -hmm. brute, brute force calculating this uh, number. Um, well, we were in the integer quantum hall uh -huh. model and we got an, an integer, but um, I mean, if, if you go back I'm not to, sure. if, if, if you go back to, in fact, the old papers of Avron and Seiler, they, they do say, look, if P was a, was a, a Q-dimensional projection, then, then in fact, 
you would get that you would get a fraction if you if you're computed this uh -huh. they actually okay. explicitly say that mm -hmm. okay so that's very interesting um uh, on, a, on a related uh, point to email, uh -huh. uh, so in, in, in all your discussions, I, I guess implicitly you're dealing with a flat torus geometry. Yeah? Yes. And um, it, it may be that if you, if, you, if you work with different geometries so that, for example, the Landau operators are, or, or other geometrically natural operators are different, then you might get a different degeneracy in, in the answer. And indeed, um, yes, exactly, the yes. gauss bonnet formula and and other things relating the curvature to the topology of the surface seems to suggest that uh, by changing the geometry, uh, you may be able to get a different answer. So maybe, oh, maybe that absolutely can... you you could try to make this uh, to get this on the sphere and see, I, I, yes, I mean you see this is the point the the point or I was genus G surface or genus G yes. So I'm not but, exactly sure. Again, we we did not do the calculation, but this was a little bit by. The point of the very last remark here on this last slide, mm -hmm. that okay, you know, we, we work on the on the torus geometry uh, for convenience, but really at the end of the day, I think what is important is that we have this relation between ground state degeneracy and in you know in these topological models, usually you expect that the ground state degeneracy depends on the the, the geometry a bit, right? On, on a finite in a finite yeah, volume. So exactly. and, so, and I think this is this is where your, your, your remark is yeah, going. So it's interesting that in principle you could get some fractions, um, but the construction of specific examples that can realize those is maybe it's not so straightforward. And maybe the suggestion is that maybe a geometric, uh, but a global geometric effect that may help you produce this. Yes, yes. Again, you, you see, we also had a bit of a specific physical uh, thing in mind with, with, with fluxes being thread through this model. So then the torus is the natural geometry. But ah, if, sure, if you sure. kind of free yourself from that, from these, uh, you know, earthly physics things, then of course you could, you could, you could go to a to more mathematical setting. I should, very interesting. Thank you. I should also say, Gochan, are you, are you going in the direction that, uh, uh, yeah. okay, this, in this uh, value of the index is multiplied by a constant in front, which depends on the geometry? Yes, because the... Because here, what, what yeah, we see, the index still takes values in... Uh, integers because q was fixed yes so uh, mm -hmm. we still yeah, have an index way, which yeah. basically takes values in the yeah, yeah uh, group of so integers but, um, that, that, that's the essence of... the constant doesn't doesn't matter that much i'm thinking of something like an all before actually so so, so now, you can if, caution, yeah. caution out the integral integrality of the curvature by some finite group action and so you can actually get some denominators in the analog of the so it's a uh -huh. gauss formula mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, can I make a comment about this? Uh, in my paper with Sopenko, we expressed the index uh, in the infinite volume set setting at the same index, but in that uh, in that uh, that expresses basically the index as the charge of fluxon, which is like uh, which is essentially what, what, what that's the way it interpreted. Like if you insert a flux, you get some charge, and it's, you can it's, a little, it's a little bit this picture, I think, right? That you that you have. So, yeah, it's basically the same picture but in infinite volume. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then we can furthermore show that, uh, so this a, a priori, this charge is not quantized. You don't know what it is. However, if you assume that the super selection sectors, if there's a finite number of subtraction sectors in the sense that, that Peter was talking about, like if you have a, something is localized at a point, but not local. Uh, so you can, uh, so since uh, then you can show that um, this number, which is a pre-register, a real number, this index is actually uh, one over n times the uh, yeah times some integer n is like number of subtraction sectors so if you know from, from some other source i don't know how to prove that there's a finite number of subtraction sectors then you get quantization in this rational sense yes and, and i would add to that that the number of super selection sectors i think should be you know related to the ground state degeneracy yes. in, in, in in a torus typically right. so with infinite right. volume you get a different integer a priori right and in principle and, and you don't even but you get only an integer if you know some from some other sort of the finite number of subselection sectors. Right. Which, by the way, there's no proof in general that if you have a lattice system, that the number of these localized mm -hmm. sectors is finite. In fact, Anton, you do you 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 do discuss uh, invertible phases in your paper. Do you actually answer partly uh, email's question about what the index does under stacking or under? No, no, yeah, yeah. We, no we do that. We do that. So we do it the uh, non-invertible case. Uh, because essentially we show the syndicate is whole conductance. 
So uh, there's a way to massage the index into a form which just becomes Kubo formula. Sure, absolutely, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. but then um, In the fact, question was, you know, it, yes, it, mm -hmm. it, if you can take, um, if you repeat the same formalism with uh, tensoring two of the models, can you show that the conductance is additive under yeah. this uh, tensoring? No, that's kind of trivial, right? Kubo formulas, obviously. Yes, I mean, I don't understand this question. I mean, in, in Sven's formalism, you tensor two systems, of course it's additive. I mean, yeah. Right. In Sven's yeah, formula is also, also obvious. Yeah. Well, this, this kind this kind of formula is additive under direct sum, not under the tensor product. No, but this That's formula is for free system. This formula is for free systems. It's specialization for free systems. Yeah, but uh, this formula in particular is is stable under direct sum, not tensor products. Yeah, but it's because it's for free systems for non tracking That's a specialization of general uh, index. Which is valid for interacting stuff to non interacting ones. Yes. Here, the phases will just multiply. I mean, it's. Uh... Yeah, that's true, actually. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's right. That's so, so, so the, the, the tensor product is actually, if you, if you go back, if you dequantize, de you go yep. to the first quantization is direct sum. Right. The Fox yes, phase on the first direct step. sum is the tensor product of Fox phase. So it is the same property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've been like oh, eating into the time of the next speaker. So that's okay. okay. Yep. Nope. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.